Good morning, Living Stones. It's Sunday, the 22nd of March, and thanks for watching. A few announcements before we begin the service. Um, again, meetings at Living Stones will be canceled indefinitely until the county lifts its shelter at home order. In fact, the whole state of California has a shelter of home order, so until these things get lifted or adjusted, we'll continue to meet via telephone, via internet, whatever, uh, video chat. So no 9.30 Sunday school class, no 11 a.m. worship service, no coffee break until these orders get lifted or until something changes. So shelter at home means only leave for essentials, doctor's appointments, exercise. Again, the local news, newspapers all have extensive coverage of this. Um, some stores, such as uh, Nugget, right over in the pocket, have senior store hours. Um, if you have a younger person living with you, maybe send them out. Make sure you wipe down your groceries, wash your hands when you come home, leave your shoes outside. There's also food delivery at home from Rayleigh's. Amazon Fresh is still kind of operating. You can order Rayleigh's e-cart and pick it up at the store and have someone put it in the car for you. There are a lot of different ways to get your needs met while avoiding physical contact with other people. So again, especially for those of you who are over 65, be very careful with this because the virus can be particularly dangerous for you. Physical distancing, however, does not mean being unsocial. Um, I've been encouraging people to call one another regularly. When I have, we, we had our, we'll probably have very regular council meetings via video calls. We had one last week. Um, make a list and call one another regularly. Check up on one another. Um, everybody needs to hear a voice of someone. Some of you are living all by yourselves, and so you can feel isolated. So, Make sure you pick up the phone and talk to people. Um, if you have symptoms, call your doctor, but also let the council know. You can maybe if you're just talking to someone else who's called from the church, say, hey, I've got some symptoms. Let the pastor know and we'll put you on the prayer chain and we'll continue to pray for you. And if you have other needs, such as if you need someone to go out and get groceries for you, something like that, let us know. Uh, the deacons are available and we'll continue to try to meet each other's needs. Um, Prepare for more online things. So if you're not, if we don't have your email address, get on the church email loop. Just send me an email. And if you have friends that are also shut in around you, get them on the loop. And I will send out an email invitation to the church email loop and announcements and all these kind of things flow through that. If texting works better for you, text me. 916-531-1381. Um, we have volunteers to help get you online if that's, in, if that's something that you struggle with. If you don't have a computer or anything like that but are looking to get one, I'd recommend maybe getting, a, getting an iPad because they're fairly simple, fairly easy to connect. They don't get viruses. I know a number of you have computers, but you've had difficulty with viruses. An iPad doesn't get viruses. So um, a smartphone as well. Smartphone, you can do almost anything on a smartphone that you can do on a computer. Um, you can do Facebook, you can do YouTube, all of these kinds of things. We have the church Facebook group, we have the church YouTube channel, and again I'll send out messages with, um, with the services and links to the services via those groups. Now some of you have commented that music isn't integrated into the service and I haven't really figured out the copyright licensing. I'll tend to get um, YouTube hits or YouTube um, copyright notices if we include music in the services. Now, throughout the week, Pete has been sending out um, links to the music we use in our services via the church email loop, and YouTube is a terrific place to find lots of wonderful music that you can play for free in your home. You can use a thing called a Chromecast and hook that up to your TV if you have a newer TV, or if you have a smart TV, and you can play music right through your TV for the house. So there's a lot of resources available online and if you have questions about that I've, we have some volunteers who would be willing to talk to you on the phone and help you get set up and and help you experience this. You've got some of you have nothing but time now might as well learn a little bit about the computer world 
and how you can get resources online. So in, in every video, in both the Facebook and the YouTube video, there will be notes, and I'll put the links from the music that Pete sends out in the notes of the video. And you can always pause the video and play a tune and go back and forth if you want to, or you can just have the video run as such and then play the music after. You can do it any way you want. So let's begin the worship service. God's greeting. Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And as God greets you, we usually greet one another. Um, again, you can pause the video and greet those of, with whom you share your home. Um, you can mentally greet those who, who are your friends and you usually greet, but God greets you and we greet one another. Now, God's law this morning, I'm going to read out of the book of Matthew. Jesus ascends onto the Sermon on the Mount, onto the Mount, and it's a, it's a sermon as such. And even though Beatitudes aren't really laws, I'll read this part. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who th hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Let's take a moment to confess our sins. Uh, the Bible instructs us to confess our sins one to another. Um, and to confess our sins to the Lord. So let's take a moment now to confess our sins and ponder the ways that we've fallen short of God's will for our lives. The Lord assures us in his word that he is faithful and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive our sins and our trespasses. And so put your hope in the Lord. Now some of you have been sending in prayer requests and some of those have come to me through council members who have been giving weekly phone calls. And so if you do have a prayer request, you can always post them on the email loop for everyone. You can email me with your prayer request. You can call me with your prayer request. Um, and you can tell a council member and they can pass it along to the church. I'm only going to use first names on these videos because they go out onto the web and anybody can see them. And if you have a prayer request and you want even more confidentiality, just let me know. Crin's grandson has been having some difficulties getting back to the States. And so if you have other questions about that, call Corinne. Because she's worried about him. Um, and so please pray for him. Martha is living alone. She's got her dogs, 
and her dogs are doing well. And I talked to her this week, and a number of you have talked to her, and I know a number of people are checking up on Martha. She has two daughters-in-law who live in Stockton, and they both have respiratory issues. And Martha has COPD, and so all of them are high risk. And so um, we're, uh, we ask for prayers for Martha and her daughters-in-law that the Lord would watch and keep them and keep them from this illness. Howard also asks for prayers for our country and for our leaders in this difficult time. Um, our leaders are going to be responsible and, and stretched perhaps far beyond what they've ever been stretched for before in terms of responsibility. And the country will be challenged to, as the governor of the state of California keeps saying, meet this moment. So we'll certainly pray for these things. Let's pray. Lord, you are the Father of grace, and you don't treat us as our sins deserve. And as, the, as Psalm 103 says, surely you have separated from our, us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so, Lord, we thank you for the redemption that you have given us in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all of the ways that you meet our needs. We thank you, Lord, if, if we have had shelter this morning, if we have been able to eat breakfast this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your church that, that now, perhaps in a very different way in this special time, upholds and connects each of us as, Lord, we need to be upheld and connected in this very special time. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Corinne's grandson as he has various struggles, and we ask, Lord, that you would meet his needs. I don't know exactly what's going on with him or, or whether or not he wants to come back to the States, but I pray, Lord, that you would be with him. I pray, Lord, that you would be with his, be with his parents and be with his grandmother as they're concerned about him. Watch over him and give him your peace. Lord, we think especially for Martha, Lord, as she has um, breathing issues herself. As she has two daughters-in-law who, because of the stay-at-home order and because of, of their underlying health concerns, cannot meet up with Martha or help care for her needs. So I pray, Lord, that you would, you would be with them as well. I pray, Lord, especially that you'd be with all of the seniors of our church who are staying especially close to home. I pray, Lord, that you would help meet their needs and, and give them the, the food that they need. I pray, Lord, that as people get sick, as individuals get sick, that, Lord, you would watch over them and give them healing and give them strength. Lord, we pray especially for the, the Faith Presbyterian Church down the road who had one of the very early victims of this illness and a whole cluster of, of other members of their church, friends of this woman who, who are now themselves tested positive and some of whom will, may likely come down with, with more severe symptoms. We pray, Lord, that you would be with that church and that you would be especially close to them. We pray, Lord, for our family and friends who are living all throughout the United States and Canada and the world. And we ask, Lord, that you would comfort and meet their needs. Lord, perhaps now, as much as ever, we are cognizant of our dependence upon your will. We pray, Lord, that you would hear our prayers, that you would meet our needs, that you would give us, in fact, our daily bread, that you would help us to forgive each other, Lord, to not hold lists of grievances against each other, especially now, Lord, that there might not be ways to, to make amends with one another. We ask, Lord, that you would keep us from temptation and keep us far from the evil one, that you would deliver us from evil. We pray, Lord, that you would, that you would in fact, hold us in the palm of your hand. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, meet all of our needs. May we put our trust in you. Give us your Holy Spirit that we might be in alignment with you, that we might be one with you, and that we might be one with each other. So hear our prayer now, in the name of Jesus, amen. I had two slides and I didn't read them before the prayer. So also in your prayers, consider those who are anxious and frightened and filled with anxiety over this. In the next coming weeks, as quite likely more and more people will test positive and others will become seriously ill and more and more people will go to the hospital, we pray for the doctors and the nurses. We also should consider those who are working in grocery stores, attending gas stations, working in all of these essential services that remain open and have, um, and have public interchange with, 
with individuals. We pray that people will be responsible, and if they're symptomatic, they would simply stay at home, and that we would you know, keep a distance from each other, six feet from one another. We should remember especially the lonely in our prayers, those who are shut in and for whom these next days and weeks will be difficult times. We should pray for those who are preparing to meet their maker. And we imagine that some who get symptomatic, who perhaps are elderly or weak, or perhaps for whom the disease is serious, will be contemplating their own death. And we pray that they would seek the Lord and call upon him as their hour approaches, that they may be ready to, to face the Lord. Now, we as a church are continuing to operate as we are. Sorry for the lack of ability to have public worship services. A lot of you have asked about, well, how you can continue to give your tithes and offerings and support the work of the church. Um, our street address is 1390 Florin Road, Sacramento, California, 95822. There is online giving on the church website. It doesn't work great, but um, especially if you're in the United States, it does work. But if you'd like to send a check, you can send a check to the church. We have a locked mailbox, and so it is secure, and I regularly come here and empty the mail. And once we get a certain amount, if your check isn't if your check isn't cashed right away, um, we're waiting until we have a few together, and then the deacons will figure out how to process them, given the, the limitations that we have on meeting one another. Now we hear God's word. Well, last week I just went straight into it and sort of did the sermon. Uh, this week I thought my rough draft for Sunday, which I do on my other channel, went quite well, and so I'm going to give you a version of that. And so if you see the longer beard and the different shirt, that's that's why things are a little bit different, because with the magic of video editing, I'm just going to splice it right into the service. Um, I don't know that I could do a better job this morning, so um, God's word will come to you that way. And as the days and weeks go by, we'll continue to find creative ways to minister to one another, and the council is talking about that um, regularly, and so at this point, continue to make phone calls to one another and encourage one another. Who sinned to cause this virus? Was it the Chinese? Was it the American government? Was it people who don't wash their hands thoroughly or break quarantine or something like that? Who sinned to cause this? Now, predictably and pretty much immediately, when something like this comes out, there will be questions about the judgment of God. Is the coronavirus a judgment from God? The pastor of the First Baptist Church, I think of Dallas or Houston or someplace in Texas, and this person was quite a visible supporter of Donald Trump, and so news agencies hit him pretty hard. Why Trump-friendly Christian leaders are feeling totally fine about the coronavirus? I really don't think any Christian leaders are feeling to totally fine about this coronavirus or just about anybody else in particular. What struck me was that the message that he gave was not all that different from a message that Tim Keller gave. Tim Keller is the author of Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, a book I very much endorse. And the, the, the answers that that Christian pastor gave are not terribly different from the answers that Christian pastors have been giving for centuries about questions like these. In fact, right at the beginning, who sinned? This comes from this week's lectionary text. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, says Jesus. Does that mean that this man and his parents were without sin? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. What is Jesus saying? This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Do you feel better about that answer? It's sort of like the Jews being God's chosen people and, the, and Israel. And if you look at everything they suffered... People often joke, well, go choose somebody else. Make somebody else your illustration. What how does how does being how is being born blind better? Because you wind up being a sermon illustration of Jesus. I'd like my sight, thank you very much. Now, to make this even more uncomfortable, there's a healing story previously in the Gospel of John where Jesus comes up to a man after he's healed him. If you're curious about this story, I've done, I did four lessons in it before coronavirus shut down the church, or at least meetings at the church. 
Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something else might happen to you. So where is Jesus on this question? In fact, this question doesn't come from nothing. If you look it up in any Bible dictionary, you'll notice that plague or pestilence come from God. There's no question that in Hebrew or the New Testament mind that plagues are part of the judgment God sends to individuals, families, and nations. God himself threatened to send plagues to the Israelites in proportion to their sins and take full responsibility for the Egyptian plagues. The Old Testament plagues demonstrate God's control over the processes of nature, just as do Christ's miracles in the New Testament. And that is consistent throughout the Bible, which is part of the reason why these questions keep coming up. Now, today, a lot of people duck them, not because of issues in the Bible, but because of what we would call the subtraction story, which is laid out by Yuval Harari in his book. He basically says that in the past, we used to think that these things came from divine agents and, and spirits and beings and things. Now we know that they just come from they just come from germs, and so we've pretty much put them out, except, of course, war, which comes from us. But even so, how many of these things don't have human fingerprints all over them? Part of this big change came with the philosophical movement called deism, which happened in the West. And you see a change in the relationship between God and his creation. Um, deism is, is said to be the belief in the existence of a supreme being, specifically of a creator who does not intervene in the universe. But even just in the way they set up that sentence, you find, which is a distinction between creature and creator in Christianity, but how in fact are they connected? And this little diagram, traditionally in the Bible, God is both transcendent, he transcends the created order, and he's imminent. He's within the created order. And my favorite example of this is Isaiah 6, where the angels cry of God, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's transcendent. The whole earth is full of his glory. He's imminent. God is very much involved. In other words, God doesn't need to intervene in creation. He's already there. In deism, that move to God is transcendent. He's still the source of the creation, but he's a little bit further away from it to then secularism um, where human beings are a buffered self, where God and creation, well, God in many for many people is the mental projection of creation up into the order. Now, now what happens as deism gives birth to enlightenment and science is that we all come to say, well, we know that plagues and pestilence are not caused by God. They're from germs and viruses, as if Let's see, right away, God and germs and viruses live on totally different planes. Um, we can treat them, we can prevent them, we can contain them. And now with COVID-19, we're wondering whether, in fact, we can. Now, now, then we say, well, these are random events. But if you ever asked yourself, what do you mean by random? See, see, random is in one way a way of saying these are things that I can't predict or control. But there's also a subtle religious assertion beneath it saying no one knows them or controls them. There's no purpose behind them. Now, this is what, when we get into this question of what do we mean by random or chance, we make an assertion. There's no purpose behind it when the truth is that we're unable often to tell when there is purpose behind something and when there isn't. If a bomb goes off, we might say, well, the particular direction of the shrapnel of that bomb have no purpose behind them. They fall randomly or chaotically, but really they don't. We just don't know how and when and exactly where they go. Random or chance are words to describe the limits of our knowledge or our capacity to predict outcomes. See, in a secularized and personal universe, there's no reason behind anything that has happened. There's no intentionality. There's no purpose. It is an event in physics without cause, purpose, or intentionality. And the whole world is as such. But if you read older documents like the Heidelberg Catechism, you very quickly learn that, well, they don't talk that way. Just listen to the language here. What do we understand by the providence of God? The almighty and ever-present ever power of God by which God upholds as with his hand heaven and earth 
and all creatures, and so rules them leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. In fact, you, you have language that says if God were to look away, everything would just fall out of existence. We're that dependent on God. And this is very different from a secularized realm where God is, is they're, they're sort of independent from each other. But already we see we, we can't really often distinguish purpose, even in people or maybe even in ourselves. And we admonish people don't presume motivation. Now, in the ancient realm, they had similar things like this in that, that the gods, Zeus and Hermes and Apollo, these things emanated from other more basic gods who emanated from what one scholar calls a meta-divine realm, out of which gods sort of emerge, just like in modern cosmology, elements just sort of emerge through processes that we may or may not be aware of. But, but in this ancient world, the gods were part of the system. They're bound by its rules. They're bound by the fates. Their, their knowledge and powers are limited. And that's why we see these gods coming out and they're chaotic and, and sometimes good and sometimes bad and doing this and doing that. And people are just here in this, in this realm and we're all trying to use the power that we have to get our own way. In the Hebrew story, it's a very, very different thing. God stands as the alternative to the meta-divine realm not subjects to the rules um, of an impersonal arena. He creates the world out of his own desire for his own purposes towards his own ends. Now, now what has happened is that God as a word is sort of used as a useful shorthand. And, and we see that, I noticed that when I watched Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris debating with each other, that for Jordan Peterson, this is where I got my idea of God number one and God number two, even though they're the same God in Christianity, God as general revelation imminent and, and God as agent, as an actor. And, and in that way, as Paul says in the book of Acts, in him we live and move and have our being, the Apostle Paul is quoting a Stoic poet and saying, it's in God that we live. Well, what does that mean? Does that, is God pantheistic? No, God is not limited, but God, in fact, creates this. And so in that sense, in him we live and move and have our being. God is sort of the arena in which the story unfolds. He's the ground of all being. He's imminent. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's God number one. But God is also beyond the created order, not exhausted by the created order. He's holy, holy, holy. He's apart from the created order. He's an agent. He's both the arena and the agent. Now, an imperfect analogy that I used with a, a group of people who were asking me about Calvinism and and predestination and all of this stuff was I sort of explained in a way a game designer, how a game designer creates a world or an author creates a book. The players have consequential agency within the book, but it's all dependent on the agency of the creator of the realm who is imminent within it. The players have contingent freedom, but the greater freedom is of the maker itself. I've once asked the question, could Frodo in the Lord of the Rings find Tolkien? Well, in one sense, you can't find Tolkien within the story of the Lord of the Rings because J.R.R. Tolkien doesn't appear there, but you can't see that J.R.R. Tolkien isn't everywhere around and even within Frodo in ways that Frodo can't know. And, and that, now all of these analogies are imperfect, but it gives us a sense that unlike deism, that God is far away from the universe, well, God is everywhere. Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. It's both and. And so when it comes to the questions of God and a pandemic like this, it's not easy to pull these questions apart. Our agency is not in competition with God's. And when, in a sense, we go against God and his agency, that is what we call sin. Now, in this story, again, it begins. As he went along, he saw a man born blind from birth. The disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Again, he's not saying his parents were without sin. He's saying you can't draw easily draw the cause and effects between necessarily, always, between this thing happening and here's the sin that caused it. Sometimes you can. You can't always. Most of the time, we can't. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Oh, in other words, all of this belongs to God and God is using it to achieve some purpose? That's what Jesus is saying. Now, we don't like to feel that way because we like to imagine like Neo, we're masters of our own destiny. Well, how is Frodo separate from Tolkien? Can Frodo imagine himself to be separate from Tolkien? He can imagine himself, he can act like he is, but he's actually created by Tolkien. But, but again, questions of agency, these things get really, really complicated. And then Jesus says this, As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. What is Jesus saying? That we see the world through him. After this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it in the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now, again, there's no conflict between the kinds of miracles that Jesus, let's say, did in, in John chapter 4, when a royal official came to Jesus, worried about his son who was about to die, and Jesus said, go home, your son's fine. Jesus healed the son just like that. Didn't have to mix blood, mix, mix mud or put anything on his eyes or anything. Because just as C.S. Lewis mentioned, when Jesus makes wine, water to wine in John chapter 2, God makes water to wine every day. Jesus just did it shortly. God can do such things like this. But God, every time water becomes wine in a vineyard here all over Northern California, God is making it such. We talk like that. We should talk like that because it's all been built by him. So the man went, washed, came home seeing. But Jesus sets these things up so that he can get the impact of the story. And again, go back and watch the Sunday school lessons on John chapter 5 where you know, Jesus is provoking conflict with the religious leaders in order to teach the people something. His neighbors and those who had seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They asked. He replied, the man that they called Jesus made some mud and put them on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I could see. Where is this man? They asked. I don't know. So then what do they do then? They take him to the religious authorities. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been born blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and turned the, the man's eyes and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Oh, Jesus was provoking them. And again, go back and watch those Sunday school lessons. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Now, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Oh, so here's where we have the data and the narrative. Here's where the, the Pharisees are trying to make sense of the world. And, and there's dissonance. They're not putting it together because the Pharisees know their Old Testament. Sin is a rebellion against God. How can, how can, how can this work? But they're also imagined that well, the mind of God can be easily known by outcomes. And so now the Pharisees are divided on this situation. Now, this is a very old subject. And in fact, it's the subject exactly of the book of Job. Because in the book of Job, calamities befall Job. And all of Job's friends say, surely you must have sinned to cause this. And Job says, no, that's not how it works. And which is exactly what Jesus says in John. That's not how it works. But Jesus also warns the other guy, stop sinning or some other something worse might happen to you than being a cripple and being 38 years by a pool and having no friend good enough to put you in the pool. 
Well, what does that mean? Is sin always connected? Is a particular instance of sin or a particular instance of calamity always connected in a way we can see it? No. Is it never connected? No. Do we like that answer? No. We want to know. Why? Because we want to control. Why do we want to control? Because we think we need what we know. We think we need what we want and what we know. And we think we know how the world should go. And so we draw very simple relationships. And we imagine we can read God's mind by seeing what happens. And that's somehow this easy math that we can do and put it on others. So they turned again to the blind man. What do you have to say about him? Or... <laughs> It was he who opened your eyes. And the man says, he's a prophet. That's kind of a standard answer. Elijah, Elisha, this guy has divine power, so he must be in alignment with God, so he must be a prophet, and that's how it happened. They still did not believe that he had been, that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you said was born blind? How is it that he can see? See, they're looking for the data, so they call in the parents, and the parents, they're having a fierce culture war, and the parents don't want to get on Jesus' side or the other side, and they totally duck the whole thing. We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how can he see now? Or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid. They are afraid he was going to get put out of the, the, out of the, out of the synagogue. Well... You can see how cultures, wars go. That's exactly what happens today. It's it's happening right now. You know, this guy's on this side. This guy's on that side. Hopefully in a pandemic, which we're seeing some of, people say, hey, let's bury the hatchet on the on the, on the the culture war, but we, we never completely resist it. Politics is now. Religion is always. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth. The guy just probably sighs. We know this man is a sinner, they replied. He replied, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've already told you and everybody else how many times and you didn't listen. Why don't you listen? Now we get into the deeper rhythms of blindness and seeing that travel through the Gospel of John. All of these themes. And again, I've been doing the Gospel of John in my Sunday school class. Listen to those Listen to those stories about the Gospel of John. There are all these layers in these stories. The the religious leaders don't want to see the truth. They are walking in darkness. They are blind. And the man is basically saying, open your eyes. And then he gets sarcastic with them. Why? Do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples too? Uh, that didn't go over well. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Contrast that with John 3, where Nicodemus says, we know that you come from God. So right there, we can see that they're, they're quite divided over Jesus because they don't know what to believe. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opens my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. That's what your Sunday school lessons say. He listens to godly people who do his will. They're not living within a metadivine realm. They're living within a Jewish context. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. This is an outstanding miracle. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Then Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And he found him. And Jesus, not just being, oh, I'm so sorry this happened to you. All the kinds of things we would say to be nice. Jesus puts yet another question to him. Jesus isn't done working in his life. This man's whole life. His sufferings, everything that he had dealt with, are there to illuminate the glory of God. And yes, he suffered. And yes, it was cruel. Was God at work in it? Jesus says yes. Not in the simplistic way we like to draw, 
But God says yes, even in the difficult things. Jesus says God was at work. And he says, do you believe the Son of Man? Now he triggers Daniel 7, where the Son of Man is this figure who is given by the Ancient of Days an eternal kingdom and a dominion that will last forever. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. Jesus said, You have seen him. Your eyes were closed. Now they can see. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. You can see him and you can hear him. How will you respond? Then the man said, Lord, I believe. I trust. And he worshipped Jesus. That's something that Jews wouldn't do. Worship a man. Imagine that the world isn't, he took his Jewish Sunday school, the world isn't an impersonal place in which God sort of emerge and, and play with things. The world is made by God. In him we live and move and have our being. You don't worship a man. God is the arena. Can he also be written into the story? Can Tolkien show up in The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings? Can the game designer become part of the game? Now, a lot of people will say this pandemic is something that God should have avoided. Well, that's awfully hard to say. Because in a sense, what we do is we sort of want God to be in the system like Zeus. And then when we say, well, this pandemic, God has no part in the making of this pandemic. Well, then suddenly, well, I guess the pandemic happened because God wasn't strong enough or the fates decreed it. Then we're very much back in a pagan realm. Now, think carefully about your choices because a lot of people, and I understand why, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, say, well, it, it, it hurts to feel that God says he loves me, but then allows these things to happen. Yeah. God allowed things to happen to Jesus. Jesus is the illustration of the book of Job. The book of Job is the illustration of Jesus. What God is saying is, I will take on pain for you. Is your impersonal metadivine realm, ancient or modern, actually better? It makes you feel better because it says, I don't imagine that God would treat me personally or allow me to suffer personally. What kind of a friend would allow that? Now, that's a deep and difficult question. In fact, this individual, Eric Weinstein, who's a very smart mathematician, articulated this in a way that I'd been struggling to try and put it into words. It's better if there is no God, because if there is a God, you don't have to worry about what's on his mind. What this reveals is that what's really deep at heart are our trust issues. But Jesus is no coward with this, and he's not afraid of nuance, nor does he have patience for the easy math answer. Who sinned, this man or his parents? No, that God's, the works of God might be displayed in him. This man has been, from the moment he was born, property of God. Oh, that, 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 vi that violates our sense of independence and that violates our sense of dignity. And, and again, as, J as Jesus said in, in John 5, stop sinning or something else might happen to you. Sin is not disconnected with our calamity. God is not disconnected from our calamities. But Jesus said, God uses these sufferings. And again, what we see are our trust issues. So after the March 15 sermon, this YouTube commenter who started over on my personal channel has come over to the church channel, said this, I always feel like Pastor Vanderclay has to match the tone of a chronically ill person. And that's, I do that on purpose because I know people suffer. And so to preach insensitively about people suffering is not wise. And you might say, well, pastor, by definition, you saying God is involved is insensitive. Well, we don't know how God is involved in the details, the easy math layer. 
but we know that God is involved in the big layer. So how do we talk about it? And then this person asked a much harder question, much more personal question. As a personal question to the pastor, what is it that God is doing that you're not okay with? Well, I'm not okay with the virus. I wasn't okay with my sister's death. I'm not okay with my father's death. I'm not okay with the poverty that I see all around me. I'm not okay with racism that I see has, has permeated American life. I'm not okay with how many things in this world. You know what I am okay with and should be less okay with? My own sin. Because when I look at my life, I realize how much stuff don't I bring on myself. I'm very... I'm very quick to blame God or blame someone else when very often the source of my troubles are me. Can I blame God for that? You can see how tricky this gets, right? What am I not okay with? A lot. Which is why I'm religious. Which is why I go to church. Which is why... Well, I go to church. I can't go to church now. Which is why religion which is why I bind myself to people and practices and books and traditions because at heart, what's the problem? What, 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 what produ pro provokes? Well, there's a lot of things that should provoke fear in me. And right now there are a lot of things to be afraid of. But what I need to learn is trust because it's not true that Christians don't get the virus and it's not true that Christians won't die of the virus. Again, go back to the sermon about the snakes. They complained about food and water and God sent snakes. And then they complained about the snakes and said, take the snakes away. And God said, no, I'm not taking the snakes away. At least make them not bite. No, the snakes still bite. At least make it not be sick. No, the people get sick. He said, put the bronze serpent up on the pole and you will not perish. Yeah, there's lots I'm not okay with, but that's just me. And I'm not the, I'm not the judge of the universe. And what I'd really love to be is to be the judge and center of the universe, but I'm not. And I can't account or answer for what all God does, but what I have to learn to do is trust. And you might say, oh, I'd prefer the meta-divine realm where it's not personal. Okay, but then there is also no purpose or plan for your goodness beyond your suffering. Then your suffering is random and there is no answer to it. Do you find that to be a better solution? I don't. So I'm religious and I'm bound to this. And this great question and answer, Lord's Day 1 of the Heidelberg Catechism, is something I memorize and something I say often, and something I hold on to in times like this. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That the CDC is going to fix this? That the government is going to have a great plan? I hope they do. I hope they do. I hope they do. But I don't have a tremendous amount of confidence in them. People have dropped the ball all along the way here. The Chinese government was in denial. The U.S. government was too slow. Maybe. I don't know. I can't know. Random? I don't know. I'm one little person. What is my only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own. And I think, I want to be my own. I want to be independent. If he turns his head, the universe flees. I'm not my own. I trust the storyteller. I trust the game designer. Well, how can you in this world of pain? It doesn't come naturally. I have to learn and lean into it. What is your only comfort in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Why? Because he fully paid for all my sins with his suffering. He has skin in the game. It's not random. It's not chanceless. My master has skin in the game. The arena became an agent and one of us. And my own sins, he's fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him. And again, there are days that I don't feel like that. There are days that maybe I wish the universe was random so I could curse God and die as Job's wife advised to him. Or I feel like I can't believe that, that God would have a hand in this and therefore not also be in control. 
because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And that's aspirational. I wish I was more wholeheartedly willing and ready to live for him, but I'm not. And so I say this to myself again and again, and I remember it and I pray it. And I say, what is my only comfort? That I am not my own body and soul. If this virus takes my body, I will be with him. If this virus takes my life, I will be with him. I can trust him. Come what may. Ever watch Moulin Rouge? Come what may. How do you understand the providence of God? The almighty and ever-present power of God by which God upholds with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness. I could rap like Freddy. Prosperity and poverty, all things in fact come to us not by chance. I can only see so far but from his fatherly hand. How does this knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing in creation will separate us from his love. For all creatures are so completely in God's hands that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. This is God's word for us. Who sinned? Well, sin is ubiquitous. Can we trust in the midst of this sin with imperfect creatures when things feel out of control? Yes, because we are not our own and we know the master, and we live in him. Let us pray. Lord, there is no mountain high enough, no river wide enough, no pit deep enough that can separate us from your love. And even now, Lord, as we, as we face the threats that this virus gives us, we pray, Lord, that you would be especially close to us. We know, Lord, that nothing can separate us from your love. We know, Lord, that we can have no greater comfort in life and in death than the knowledge that we are not our own, but we belong to you, body and soul and life and in death, because you have fully paid for all our sins with your precious blood and has set us free from the tyranny of the devil. We believe in this, Lord, and we ask that we might, in ever-increasing measure, be fully ready to, to serve you. So, Lord, give us your spirit and give us your peace and may we, in fact, Lord, in every day with the challenges that each day brings us, be ready to bear witness to you, not only with our words, but also with our lives. May, Lord, may our lives, ourselves, be like yours. May we embody you as we meet one another, as we again rise to face the challenges that each day brings. And may we rest assured every day that we lie in the hollow of your hand. So hear our prayer now, in the name of Jesus, amen. Receive God's blessing. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power of forever and ever. Amen.